Greetings, everyone. Um, we are here tonight with, and the morning at Canada Indeed, uh, with our um, beloved speaker, Mohammed Banji. He is going to tell us about masterpieces of the Islamic art from the Al Khan Museum collections. Before we hand over the show to Mr. Panji, I would like to add that he is the one who promotes pluralism through art and stories, and he enlightens in culture and across cultures. He fosters a great understanding of the contribution that Muslim civilizations have made to the world heritage. So during the session, uh, during the session, you may leave your queries in our chat box, and at the end of the session, you may have direct feedback and question as the sessions with Mr. Bhanji. Thank you, Mr. Bhanji, for taking out time, and we are eager to know about your presentations. Over to you, Mr. Bhanji. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mahin, for the kind introduction, and I'm humbled to give uh, this particular presentation. Uh, what I'm going to do is to show you some of the highlights of the masterpieces of Islamic art, which we have at the Aga Khan Museum. And in essence, what you are going to see uh, in this presentation is the diversity which exists in the cultural expression uh, of the Islamic world. So let's go to the next screen. Mahin, are you able to switch it to next screen? Okay. Okay, so let me start. And the, what I would like to do is to explain to you why was there a need for, the, for a museum and why in Canada. So in essence, the Aga Khan Museum was conceived as an educational and, and an outreach institution in the field of Islamic art and architecture. And the reason why uh, the Aga Khan decided to establish the museum is essentially to replace ignorance with knowledge. And in fact, uh, he has explained that the ignorance spans from various aspects of Islam. What is generally not known is the pluralism which exists within the Islam, the diversity of interpretations of the various Quranic faiths, the whole chronological and geographical extent of its history, culture, and so on. Okay, okay so let's go to the next slide. Okay. Mahin, can you go to the next slide? Okay, so the question is, why was the museum established in Canada? And Aga Khan has explained that what happens on the North American continent, whether culturally, economically, or politically, cannot fail to have worldwide repercussions. And that's the reason why, or one of the reasons why he decided to establish the museum in Canada. And particularly, he's fascinated by Canada's example for pluralism. Okay? Like Canada has a wonderful tradition of tolerance, which has permitted diversity to flourish. So let's say if you are walking on the streets of Toronto, okay, you will encounter people from uh, various cultures okay, uh, on the streets of Toronto. Okay. Uh, next slide. Okay. So I wanted to show you what the museum looks like. Okay, so uh, the museum is set in a 17 acre park, uh, which is known as the Aga Khan Park. And there are two architectural gems within that particular site. One is the Aga Khan Museum and the other one is uh, an Ismaili center. And although it is called a museum, uh, it is not a museum like any other. I think it's more like a cultural hub because we have an auditorium for performing arts. We have a restaurant, we have shops, okay? So it gives you an idea that it's a sort of a meeting place for all the cultures. And it's a very architecturally inspiring building. It was designed by the world-renowned Japanese architect by the name of Fumihiko Maki. Okay? And what the Aga Khan did was he asked him that light might be the concept around which you could design an outstanding museum. And what Maki has done, he has designed the museum in such a way that the building itself acts like an ever-changing canvas. So by the time sun rises to the time sun sets, part of the building is in light and the other part is in shadow. 
And depending on the distance you are standing from the uh, museum and the angle you are looking at, although the, it's the same Brazilian granite which is covering the entire museum, you will notice subtle changes in color and shade. So it acts like a sundial. And that's the reason why Aga Khan hoped that the building itself will be seen as a work of art and architecture. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. Okay. So the mission of the museum is to connect different cultures through art. And uh, in our collection, we have a 10th century dish, a ceramic dish from Iran or Samarkand. And if you look at the rim of the dish, okay, uh, it says in Arabic Pufic script that generosity is the disposition of the dwellers of paradise. So what you'll find is even in everyday objects, you will find this type of proverbs which are embedded in the object itself because they were meant for everyday use. So the idea is what the artist wanted to do was to inspire people with the type of proverbs which they see. Now, if you look at the central design, it's an interlocking network, okay? And what it signifies is it shows that we are all interconnected that uh, Allah has created us from a single soul, but we are all interconnected. We should live in peace and harmony. And it also shows the dynamism of pluralistic disposition. Okay? And that explains why this was selected uh, as a logo of the museum, because one of the aims and objectives is to promote pluralism through art. Okay? Uh, next slide. Can you, yeah. Okay. So what I wanted to show you, and I don't expect you to read this, what it's showing is the chronological and geographical extent of the Islamic history, right from the time of inception of Islam, when revelation was granted to uh, Prophet Muhammad uh, in year 610. And as you know, the revelation continued for 23 years thereafter. And after, uh, as a result of the faith of Islam itself, the message of faith and ethics, but also I'll show you in the next slide why Islam spread so rapidly after the death of the prophet. Okay, so here you see, this is one representation of the chronological and geographical extent of the Islamic history. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, now when you enter our permanent collection, we have an animated world map. And in, on that world map, what we try to show is the name of the dynasty, uh, its geographical period, uh, or its time period, and the geographies over which that particular dynasty ruled. So here, for example, is, we are starting with the first four caliphs uh, of the Islamic faith and the geographic area in which uh, they were living at the time. So this map is an animated map. So it goes from uh, the uh, starting with the Abbasid dynasty, uh, the Umayyads, the Fatimids and so on. So viewers, when they, uh, the visitors, when they come to our museum, get a feeling and a sense of the uh, geographic expanse of the Muslim dynasty, all the way from Spain in the West to China in the East. Okay. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Okay. And here I'm showing you uh, like a map, which is of the Silk Road. So when I showed you the geographic uh, spanning of uh, the Islamic dynasties, okay, they were all connected as early as 2 century BCE by the Silk Road. Okay. And uh, if you look at, if you study the history of the Silk Road, what you'll find is that man has always traveled whether it is for commercial reasons or at that particular time uh, for, point, for conquest of other territories or in search of new knowledge, he has always traveled. And when men traveled, he met with uh, other travelers and he imbibed their culture. And in turn, the other people imbibed his culture. So Silk Road has always symbolized cultural dialogue. Okay? And what you'll find is whether it was merchants, scholars, pilgrims, 
going for pilgrimage to Mecca, most of them traveled along the Silk Road. So this, that has become a symbol for cultural dialogue. And what we are going to see in this presentation is the objects which we are going to encounter. I point out the different cultural influences in the creation of the objects. There's a reason why I wanted to show you that map. Okay, let's go to the next screen. Okay. Now, uh, before launching into the actual objects, I wanted to give you a little bit of history of human thought. So if you look at, uh, if you study the history of uh, civilizations from seven to 13 centuries, uh, Muslim civilizations, they dominated world culture and learning. And what they did was they took the knowledge from the other civilizations, whether it was Greek, Chinese, uh, Indian, Persian, and they accepted it and adopt, also adopted that, particularly in the area of mathematics, philosophy, medicine, astronomy, and almost every area of learning. Okay. But what they did was they added their own knowledge once they assimilated the knowledge from previous civilization. Okay. Now, although I'm telling you about this, this fact is not quite well known uh, in the Western world and perhaps not to the extent that it should be even in the Islamic world. And this is what the museum is trying to hopefully educate the people who pass to the museum. Uh, next screen. Okay, so let's talk about the flowering of culture and learning uh, in the Islamic world. So what you will notice is throughout the Islamic world, <clears throat> starting with the Abbasids in uh, Baghdad, they established Beit al-Hikmah, which was the house of wisdom. And the houses of science were established in centers like Cairo, in Morocco, in Tunisia, in Andalusia, which is present day southern Spain and Portugal, okay, uh, in Ghazni, in uh, Afghanistan, in Bukhara, in Uzbekistan, and so on. So one thing which characterized the Islamic world was the pursuit of knowledge, okay? And that's uh, extremely important, okay? And the question is, how was this knowledge developed? Uh, initially, what happened was at Beitul Hikmah and other houses of science, there was a translation movement. So they took the knowledge of the Greek philosophical and scientific works and also from other traditions, and they translated it in Arabic. And then they added their own discoveries to, uh, to take it to new, new directions. So what you will notice is the scholars and the philosophers of the Islamic world, they provided vital influx of knowledge to for the European Renaissance to happen. Okay. Uh, next screen. Okay. Now, let's talk about the contribution made by uh, Muslim scholars. Okay. Uh, essentially, what the Muslim scholars did, they sharpened the cutting edge of human knowledge. Okay. And if you look at Muslim scholars, they were equivalents of Plato, Aristotle, Galileo, and Newton. Yet, uh, their names are scarcely recognized in the West today. So if you take just one example, Al-Khwarizmi, he was the one who developed some 1200 years ago algorithm, which is the foundation of our search engine technology. So today, if you want to search anything, uh, we just pick up our smartphone, okay, go to Google and you put in a request for any search, okay? But that the underlying technology was, the algorithm was developed by Al-Khwarizmi. Now just think what would have happened if Al-Khwarizmi had uh, patented his technology. Okay. You can just think of the uh, repercussions of that. Okay. Uh, next slide. Okay. Okay. Now, although I've been talking about the contribution made by Muslim scholars in medieval ages, uh, what, I, what we try to show is even today, Muslims are making an important contribution. And I'm just highlighting two examples so recently, uh, there was one organization which studied all the academic papers uh, uh, which had been produced in different fields of science. 
And what's interesting is, okay, out of when you talk medical science, okay, out of all the top scientists, okay, there was only one scientist, Professor Bhuta from Aga Khan University. He's considered to be top 100 scientists in medicine. Okay. Or if you take in the field of uh, astronomy and astrophysics and so on, uh, you might have uh, know, you might know that when NASA landed their uh, rover on Mars and they were searching for evidence of life uh, through evidence of water, they flew a helicopter on Mars and the systems engineer and the person who was responsible for flying the helicopter on Mars is a Muslim woman by the name of Farah Ali Bey. And she happens to be Montreal from where uh, I, I used to live and now I'm in Toronto. So just to give you a couple of examples that even today, Muslim scholars are excelling in different fields. Uh, next screen. Okay. So the question is, what has inspired Islamic art? Okay. And the simple answer is that Quran has been the source of insp inspiration, both for art and architecture. Okay. So it's, we can categorically say that if, was, if there was no Holy Quran, okay, the Islamic art would not exist and we would not have needed museums to showcase the works of Islamic art. That is the importance of Quran for the Islamic faith. Okay? And if you take uh, the particular example of the Aga Khan Museum, uh, and just to give you some historical context, the Aga Khan's ancestors who were the Fatimid Imams and Caliphs, thousand years ago, they uh, founded the city of Cairo. And they were both the patrons of art and architecture. And they fostered the creation of outstanding works of art, as well as they established libraries with rare and significant manuscripts. And I'll be showing you uh, one or two during our presentation. But at the present time, many members of the Aga Khan's family, particularly his late uncle, Prince Sadruddin, are art lovers and collectors of art. So at the age of 20, uh, Prince Sadruddin went to Harvard and he met a fellow student who became his mentor and he started uh, his collection of Islamic art. Uh, later on, he became the High Commissioner of Refugees in, at the United Nations. In this, despite his busy schedule, he kept on collecting works of art. Okay? So when he passed away in 2003, in the hands of a single individual, he had collected masterpieces of Islamic art of museum proportions. And when he passed away, his widow, Princess Catherine, asked His Highness the Aga Khan, because he was planning to establish a museum here, to become the owner of the works of art. And I'm going to show you some of the masterpieces. Uh, next screen. Okay. Okay. Now, in order to appreciate Islamic art, uh, we need a little bit of familiarity with the vocabulary of surface decoration in Islamic art and architecture. And of course, the most important part of Islamic architecture is calligraphy. And you can understand why. When the Quran was revealed to the prophet, it was an oral tradition. And prophet would recite what was revealed to him by Allah to his companions and to his followers. And they would try to remember it. Now, although the secrets of paper making were known to the Chinese, they had not come to the Islamic world until the end of the eighth century. So what the art, uh, what people did at the time, uh, in order to record the revelation, they would take animal skin, which is usually uh, sheep skin, they would clean it, dry it, treat it with lime, so it became a writing surface. And then they would record and give visible form to Allah's revelation, okay? And you can see the virtuosity. On the left-hand side, I'm showing you uh, a, a Quranic verse, which is Suratul Ikra, written on a chestnut leaf, and that's from 19th century in Turkey. So calligraphy is held and considered to be a noble art form because it's used uh, the art of beautiful writing to give material uh, aspect to Allah's revelation. 
This other second thing you shall find in Islamic art and architecture is the geometric design. And geometry is considered to be the language of the universe or the language of the creation. And in our museum, we have a courtyard okay, with uh, 13 meters uh, glass screens, which have been imprinted with geometric design using eight pointed star as the motif, which keeps on repeating. And even on the floor, as you can see uh, in this particular diagram, you see the geometric design, okay? So geometry is an important aspect of surface de decoration, but you also see flora and fauna in, as part of the design, okay? So here I'm showing you just one example of uh, design of flowers, which comes, which is also shown on Taj Mahal. And we have figural images of uh, humans, animals, birds, and so on. And here I'm showing you an example, okay? So what you'll notice in the arts you are going to see are this type of designs either by themselves or in some combination, okay? Uh, next screen, okay? So now what I'm going to do is to take you on a journey across cultures and time and I'll show you about a dozen objects and uh, works of art. And what they are going to do is to highlight the arts of Islamic world from every region, covering every time period from the inception of Islam to the 20th century. And the objects you are going to encounter will be on every kind of material which people would have found in the Muslim world at the time. Okay. And just in this uh, map where I put where these objects come from, you can see the geographic diversity and also the diversity of the time period. Uh, next screen. Okay. Now the very first work of art which I would like to show you is what, uh, which is in our collection is known as the Blue Quran. It is a celebrated uh, Blue Quran. Okay probably made in Tunisia in the early Fatimid period. Although scholars are still debating today on uh, exactly where this Quran uh, was made. Some say it was in the Abbasid period uh, 50 or 100 years earlier, but other scholars uh, differ. So, but regardless of uh, what the scholars think, okay, it's a very beautiful work of art, okay? It is on a parchment, which is animal skin, which I described earlier, and the writing which you see is in gold. Okay? So you see beautiful writing, okay? and it's of course, uh, being Arabic script, it is written from right to left. And in the hand of an expert calligrapher, they can take any Arabic letter and they can either stretch it horizontally, pull it vertically, or even bend it in shapes. Okay, so the Arabic calligraphy lends itself to almost works of art. Okay, uh, next screen. Okay, now uh, in our collection, uh, since what we are trying to do is to show the diversity of art, we also have uh, in the Quran, there's not only a diversity of interpretation, but also diversity in the scripts in which the Quran uh, has been written. So it's the same Arabic language, but what you'll find is uh, diversity in the way it has been executed. And I'll confess to you, I don't read Arabic, but even looking at it visually, you can make out the difference. So what I've tried to do is show you examples of the Quran in our collection. Okay, at the top left hand corner, you see the Quran from Valencia in Spain. Okay, the earlier one from uh, North Africa, okay, from the 10th century, but I'm also showing you examples of the Qurans, okay, which were uh, made in India, in China, as well as uh, in Indonesia. Now, what is interesting about the Chinese script, okay, it is known as a Sini script, which is quite elongated, okay, so just to point out the variation in the scripts, and of course, Quran was revealed orally and it was meant to be recited, but scripture is there to help people to always have the guidance of Allah. Okay. Next screen. Okay. 
And so if you look at the very first revelation in the Quran, Allah says that we created humankind. We created humankind from a single clot of blood. And we taught, we taught by the pen, we taught men which he knew not. Okay. So the word pen in the very first revelation is a metaphor for knowledge. Okay. And we are quite familiar with uh, certain proverbs and sayings like seek knowledge from cradle to grave or the ink of a scholar is holier than the blood of a martyr or even travel far and wide, even to China uh, in search of knowledge. Okay, so when it comes to intellectual pursuit, okay, that injunction comes to the Muslims directly from the Quran. And just as a side note, okay, what I wanted to show you is just the contribution made by Muslims. So if you were to Google who invented the fountain pen, the answer you will get is the name of uh, uh, someone from Romania who was studying in Paris in the mid 19th century and who, had an, who wanted to take notes very quickly. So it says that he invented the fountain pen. But if you go into the Islamic history, okay, and what Google will not tell you, that the pen was invented around year nine, uh, between 950 and 975, okay? And it was commissioned by the Fatimid Imam Khalif al muiz And he actually provided detailed specification of what the fountain pen should look like and uh, what the form should be and what its function should be. That it should hold the ink. And if the person desired to write, it would write beautifully. But when he lifted the pen, the ink would stop flowing and it would not stain when the uh, fountain pen is again put back uh, in the garment of the person carrying it. Okay, So just I wanted to show, uh, give a small example of the contribution made uh, by Muslims. Okay. Uh, next slide. Okay. 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 So the next work of art uh, and we, which I want to show you is the manuscript. Now, if you look at what uh, the great British scientist, okay, Sir Isaac Newton, he said that if he was able to see further than his predecessors, because he stood on the shoulders of the giants. And among the giants were uh, philosophers and physicians and other scholars like Ibn Sina, Ibn Rushd, who was the philosopher in the 12th or 13th century in Andalusia, uh, the geographer Al-Idrisi Al uh, in, in Sicily uh, at the time around the 12th or 12th century. Okay, and there are a host of other Muslim scholars and scientists. Okay. Now, we are quite fortunate that in the collection of the Aga Khan Museum, we have a manuscript which is called Canon of Medicine by Ibn Sina. Okay. He was a Persian polymath. He was both a philosopher, physician, and a poet. And he had composed about 200 books. Okay. But in particular, uh, what he's extremely well known for is his five volume encyclopedia, which is known as Canon of Medicine. Now, Ibn Sina was the first one to say that there are certain diseases which are transmitted from human to human through microorganisms. And several centuries later, when microscope was invented, his theory got validated. Okay? And Ibn Sina was the one also to say that if there is a pandemic, the, the cure, the remedy for pandemic is to isolate for 40 days. Okay. And the merchants along the Silk Road, the Italian merchants and other scholars, they heard the word 40 in what uh, Ibn Sina was prescribing, that they translated the Arabic word 40 into Italian called quarantina, from which we get the word quarantine. Now, just imagine if when our pandemic started, we had listened to the advice of Ibn Sina, how many countless lives could have been saved? Okay. And to tell you the extent of knowledge and scholarship of Ibn Sina, okay, his canon of medicine was translated into Latin. And for 500 years later, if you're studying medicine at European University, 
this is the uh, uh, text which you would use to study medicine. Okay? And Ibn Sina's canon of medicine was also translated into Chinese and even Hebrew. Okay? Uh, next screen. Okay? And just before I talk about this fountain, okay, uh, Ibn Sina has been honored. Okay? So today, if you go to Aga Khan University in Karachi, one of the buildings is named after Ibn Sina. Okay, to uh, show you the importance of the work he did. Okay. Now, in our museum collection, uh, we have quite a large fountain, okay, and that would have been in the home of a wealthy Egyptian person uh, in the 16th, early 16th century. And you will find this type of fountains also in Syria. Okay. Now, what's interesting about this fountain, if you look at it, you see the geometric design. Okay. Okay, but in the center, you have a fountain. And initially, I mentioned to you about the oral culture uh, within the Islamic world. Okay, so you can imagine that in the evening, the family would be seated around. Uh, perhaps poetry might be recited or music might be pl uh, playing. Uh, water will be flowing from the fountain. And the, uh, the flow of water uh, and the sound has a very soothing effect. But also from a climate perspective, okay, the water would evaporate and it would have a cooling effect for the surrounding room. Okay? But also symbolically, water is considered an essential source of life. Okay? And it's also, it is also a symbol of paradise where there are Quranic verses which speak about that uh, the gardens uh, of paradise are replete with gushing fountains and flowing rivers. Okay? But if you have to ask the question, how did the water flow into this fountain? Okay, once again, if you go back into the history, as early as the 12th century, Al Jazari had invented, uh, he was a mechanical engineer, and he had in, invented devices to lift water. And he also developed a machine, crank and shaft, to convert rotary motion into linear motion to pump water over long distances again to point out the contributions made by Muslim scholars and scientists. Okay, next screen. Okay. Now, uh, in our collection, we also have fragments of uh, textile tiras. Okay. Now, one thing about textile and also works of parchment, okay, they are very sensitive to light. Okay, and uh, when they survive, usually they are in fragments. Okay, and, and the reason why they have survived is either they were given, uh, they were used uh, like burial shrouds, so they remain buried and they were found during archaeological excavations. But if you study the history, the garments made of textiles, particularly in Egypt, were given as robes of honor upon scholars and other dignitaries. Okay, so when the Aga Khan University was established, uh, uh, in uh, mid 1980s in Karachi. And when the first convocation was taking place, okay, the question was what type of academic regalia should be created for the Aga Khan universities? Okay? And they reached back into history to the Fatimid period. And they found that the robes of owners were bestowed on the scholars. And from that, what you find is the regalia which is used presently at the Aga Khan University. So as a chancellor, uh, the Aga Khan's robe is white with very detailed embroidery in gold. Okay? And when you look at the president and the provost, okay, they are wearing green robes with two bands of gold embroidery. Okay? And other members of the board of trustees, they would have green robes with one band and the students are wearing green robes uh, with a white uh, jamia posh or uh, a hat. Okay. So what I'm trying to do is trying to make a connection between the historical and the contemporary. And that's what we try to do in our collections also uh, during our tours. Next object. Okay. Now, this is quite an intriguing object. Okay. If you look at it closely, it is a cowed ivory horn. Okay. And it is known as oliphant. So, oliphant is an old French word 
going back almost to the 12th century. Okay. Now, what's most interesting about this particular object, okay, if you look at it closely, the design which you see are both real and mythical animals. And that particular design was actually pioneered in Egypt. And olifants are also known under Egypt during the Fatimid period. But what's interesting is, initially the function of this object was like a hunting horn. 400 years later, in year 1620, this object showed up in England where these silver mounts were added. So you see this piece of silver, okay, like a chicken leg. Okay, that was added 400 years later. And most likely, the function of this object changed to a ceremonial function. And the curators and art historians who have studied this object, they say that it was given as a wedding gift to Lady Sarah Coventry and her husband, Sir Charles Hargrave, used to work for King Charles I. And when the curator studied the design on this, they found uh, the coat of arms of belonging to that family. That's the reason why they are able to talk about the provenance of this object. Okay. Uh, next screen. Okay. Now, whenever we look at the object, not only do we try to describe the object and give the history of the object, but also we try to find out the historical context. What made that particular object possible? Okay. Now, in this particular case, I told you that it was made in Sicily in the 12th century. So you might ask the question, why do we have an object made in Sicily in a museum devoted to Islamic art? Okay. Now, if you look at the geographies, which I was talking to you earlier, at the height of the Fatimid Empire, Sicily was part of the uh, Fatimid Empire, which ended, I think, in year 1173. And this particular object was made uh, somewhere in the 12th century. At that time, Sicily was under the Christian Norman King Roger II. And although he was a Christian king, he retained Arabic as the language. He used Muslim method of administration and he gave employment to merchants, artists, and artisans from the Fatimid Cairo and North Africa and so on. So the people who had the skills in carving the artist perhaps came from uh, Egypt. Okay. Now, if you looked at the size of the tusk, okay, most likely it came from Savannah elephant in West Africa. Okay, so that tusk would have traveled along the Trans-Saharan route, okay, through the Sahara Desert, through present-day Tunisia, across the Mediterranean to Sicily. Okay, so you now know where the raw material came from, where the artist came from, and what was the cultural context which enabled the creation of that particular object. Okay, so this object tells a remarkable story of cross-cultural fertilization. So what you'll find as part of this tour for the rest of my presentation, the artifacts and the objects which I show you, okay, they will indicate and they tell the stories of intercultural engagement. Okay, next object. Okay. Now, one of the most interesting objects we have in our collection, and if you look at it closely, okay, is called an astrolabe. Okay. And astrolabes are both computational and navigational devices. So the object you are looking at is visually beautiful to look at. Okay. And initially I was talking to you about the prophet and the revelation. Okay. So the prophet prescribed that during prayers, you should be facing Mecca. And he also prescribed times of prayer. Okay. So although the astrolabes were invented by the Greeks, they were perfected by Muslims because they had a need uh, for uh, finding direction, telling time, and also other host of other uses. Okay. Now, when you look at this device, okay, you can think of it as a 14th century GPS. Okay. But what's most remarkable about this particular astrolabe, although you will find astrolabes in most museums of uh, Islamic uh, art, okay, this particular astrolabes has engraving in Latin, okay? And perhaps that maker was probably a Christian 
And I think he passed away because of pandemic at the time. And later on, we find engravings in Arabic. And that the art historians know that it was done by an Algerian by the name of Al Masud. But the story doesn't quite end there. Okay. You will also find inscriptions in Hebrew. So probably there was a Jewish either astronomer or a navigator who also made use of this particular astrolab. Okay. So interestingly, this particular astrolab okay, has inscription in three languages. So what does it tell us about the time period in which it was made? So let's go to the next screen. Okay. Now, if you think about this particular time period, okay, from 8th to the 15th century, okay, uh, uh, Al-Andalusia, which is present in southern Spain and Portugal, was under Muslim rule. It was a time when Muslims, Christians, and Jews not only lived in peace and harmony, but they were open to the scholarship of the other. And because of this pluralistic uh, tradition and pluralistic disposition, what we find during that time period, there was a lot of scientific progress. There was advancement in philosophical knowledge. And we saw artistic creativity, which we just, show, just saw in the, in the astrolabe and other inventions at the time. Okay. And in fact, the reason why this object is so important is it very convincingly tells the story of pluralism and what is possible if people live in peace and harmony. Okay. Uh, next slide. Okay. Now, we also try to point out the connections of our objects okay, to different uh, situations. Okay, so the one question, one thing which I always try to bring out is normally when visitors come to the museum, they might assume that all the works of art which they see, okay, have been created by men, okay, which is not true because women played an important role, but unfortunately women's contribution is not generally well recognized. And also other thing about uh, Islamic art, okay, the fact that they were created in Muslim land okay, does not mean that it was the Muslims only who created those works of art. Uh, for example, we know during Fatimid period, Coptic Christians were quite instrumental uh, in creating certain uh, works of art. There were Jewish people, uh, Muslims of all backgrounds and people of other faiths, all of them living under Muslim rule, they created these works of art. So when it came to Astrolab, there was a woman by the name of Maryam al astrolabi She lived in early 10th century in Aleppo in Syria. Okay? And she was uh, not only an astronom astronomer, but she was an expert Astrolab maker. And she, she took the invention of the Greeks and she took it to new heights. Okay? Uh, and again, Astrolab also is an interesting connection to Canadian history. So Samuel de Champlain, a French explorer, in year 1613, he was traveling through the Ottawa River on his journey of discovery, and he lost the astrolabe. And it remained buried for more than 200 years until it was found by a farm boy. Okay. And initially, it ended up uh, at a museum in New York. But because of its historical significance to the creation of Canada, Canadian government acquired it. I'm sure they paid a high price for it. And today that, muse, uh, that particular uh, astrolabe is in the museum, history museum in Ottawa. And the lake near which this particular astrolabe which was found uh, was known as Green Lake, has now been renamed Astrolabe Lake. Again, to show interesting connections and to make the visit of our uh, visitors more interesting. Next slide. Okay, so next, I want to show, take a look at these two pharmacy jars. So let's say you are shopping in the bazaars of Damascus in the 15th century. What you would do is you would encounter merchants from Florence, Venice in that bazaar. And they would have 
ordered this type of pharmacy jars, both for their aesthetic beauty, but also to carry pharmaceutical materials back to the Italian city states. Okay, so today we talk about globalization, international trade. Okay, that was already happening uh, in the 15th century between Italy and Syria in this particular example. Okay, and if you look at the design of the jar, it is cylindrical and long. But if you look at the mouth, it is done in such a way okay, that the rim is sticking out. So you can imagine a rope being tied here and here and the two jars full of pharmaceutical materials being carried back to the Italian city states. And we get an indication because when you look at this design, this is the design of Fleur de Lis. Okay? And in the 15th century, that was the coat of arms of the city of Florence. Okay? Uh, next screen. Okay? Now we looked at the visual symbol of coat of arms. And if you look at the works of art, and if you look at history, okay, we find that a same visual symbol is shared across different cultures. So for example, Fleur de Lis was also the uh, symbol of French royalty. Okay, uh, today, if you look at the flag of the province of Quebec in Canada, it is Fleur de Lis. And I also, also came across Canon of Medicine, the earliest version which was translated in Latin, and you see the example of Fleur de Lis. But there's an interesting story of where Fleur de Lis also appears. So there was an African king by the name of Mansa Musa. He was the richest person who ever lived. And he was from Timbuktu in Mali. And he went to, when he went to pilgrimage in the 13th century, okay, to Mecca, okay, and if you read the story, Okay, he was carrying, he controlled 50% of the gold supply in the Mali Empire. Okay, he had 100 camels filled with nothing but gold. And during his trip, and when he reached Cairo, he kept away giving up so much gold that even in Europe, he became quite famous. So in the 13th century Catlin or the 14th century Catlin Atlas, you see the image of Mansa Musa being on the physical atlas. He's wearing a golden uh, uh, crown, holding a golden orb, but he's also carrying a scepter with Fleur de Lis. So what's interesting is if you are a European, okay, living in Europe in the 14th century, and if you look at this atlas, and if you saw this image, and when you look at the, fleur, the symbol of Fleur de Lis, you would recognize this African king as a very powerful emperor. Uh, next screen. Okay. Okay. And now here I'm showing you the example of a double door. Okay. Now, if you look at it closely, okay, okay. it's a remarkable example of craftsmanship. Okay. Uh, this individual piece, which I'm showing you here of the geometric design, each piece was individually hand carved. Okay. And it was put together using a method called tongue and groove, which means fitting like Lego pieces without any adhesives or without any nails. Okay. Now, what is most interesting about this particular object, you see the geometric design here. You see the design of arabesque, which is a floral design. But here you see the inscription in Arabic. Okay. And it reads, Okay, it says, Prophet the most glorious, he said, renouncing this world is more righteous than worship. And at the bottom here, you see the signature of the craftsman. Okay, it says, Master Rustam, son of Haji Najar, and he has actually put the date. Okay, now what's interesting is, okay, look at his signature. Okay, he's acknowledging that he learned craftsmanship from his father, Najar. Okay, and the title Haji indicates that his father has actually gone to pilgrimage. So what you'll find is this concept of master and disciple type of relationship. Okay. Now, if you look at the size of the door, okay, and particularly if you are in a museum, the door is not as tall as it should be. And if you look at what the inscription says, it gives an indication that perhaps this would have been an internal door 
leading to a chamber in a Sufi establishment for uh, worship or contemplation. Okay, and perhaps the person who commissioned this door or the craftsman himself deliberately made the door slightly shorter that the person entering the room would be would have to bow down to the saying of the prophet. This one possible interpretation to what we see on the worship on what is said here in the side of the door. Okay, next screen. Okay. Uh, we also uh, have an example of uh, other objects, uh, again, which, you, which you, you could find in a Sufi establishment. It is known as a cash pool or it is a begging ball. Okay. And what you see here are the inscription, okay, which talk about the Prophet Muhammad's two miracles. One is Miraj, where we, in the Quran, it mentions in Suratul Isra, his accession, where he encounters the divine, and also his miracle of splitting the moon. Okay. Now, I've been a tour guide for uh, more than four years at the museum. And I used to see this object almost uh, in every tour and I would just pass by. And then suddenly I noticed that at the two ends are the two dragon heads. So I asked the question to myself, what do dragons signify in Islamic art? Okay, so if you, let's go to the next screen. Okay, so trying to, when I did the research to find out what is the symbolism of dragons in Islamic art? Because I had a feeling that it had somehow, dragons have a connection to Chinese philosophy. But what I found out that even in Islamic world, okay, dragons not only are frequently cited as a fabulous beast, but the fire which comes from the mouth of a dragon at the same time, it is signifies the hell of destruction or signification for the hell, but also the divine light of Allah. Okay, So what we find is, and if you go back to the Chinese philosophy, there is this notion of dualism, that things which appear contrary may actually be very contemporary. So here what we are saying is the hell of destruction and that fire is also the light of the divine. Okay. So what's interesting is, and I tell people at the end of my tour, that one lifetime is not enough to learn about the 1,000 or 1,200 objects we have in the museum. And what I'm showing you is about 12 objects, which is just 1% of what we have in our collection. Okay. Next screen. Okay. Now, uh, in our museum collection, and Prince Saduddin was a connoisseur of manuscripts and miniatures. And we have one particular miniature painting from a manuscript which is called Shahname, which is an epic uh, poem composed by the Persian uh, poet by the name of Firdoshi. That particular poem is composed of 50 or 60,000 rhyming verses. And it is considered like a book of kings or mirror for the princes on how uh, Shah of Iran or how any ruler is supposed to behave towards their subjects. And because it's such a, it's one of the longest literally works in our history. And because of the subject matter and importance, okay, it has the stories of 50 Shahs of Iran from the time of creation to the pre-Islamic conquest of Persia, I think in year 642 or something. Okay. And because it has stories from the time of creation, of course, those are the mythical or the legend, legendary king. Okay. And every Shah of Persia would commission their own version of uh, Shah Nameh. Okay. So the second Safavid Shah, Shah Tamas the second, he commissioned his Shahname, which had 256 illustrations. And what we find is these illustrations pass through different hands of different collectors. And because they do not know Persian, in order to maximize 
the value of their investment, they would disperse in folios and try to sell it. So let's go to the next screen. Okay, uh, this particular uh, diagram, it is so intricate, okay, that art historians have studied it and they said that it would have taken the painter Sultan Mohammed okay, three years to, to make this particular pa uh, miniature painting. And that particular painter would have used a paintbrush made of a single hair of a squirrel. Okay? And some consider this to be like Mona Lisa of Islamic art. It is that detailed. And it has an interesting story around it. So let's go to the next screen. Okay. Yeah. So there's an international arts magazine called Apollo. And they asked five museum directors in US, where would you take American school kids to? Okay. So the uh, director of the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, Gary Tintro, he said, I would take uh, his students on a field trip to Toronto okay, to see this uh, coat of Kayu Mars, this particular painting, which continues to fascinate particularly when it's really magnified, okay? And then he gives an explanation that if you look at this painting, okay, it not only contains in exquisite detail the flora and the fauna, but it shows a rainbow coalition of human beings from every continent and every culture as if what one would see on the streets of Toronto. So earlier I was telling you why the museum was established here in Toronto in Canada. Okay, and because Canada okay, has made a decision that although diversity is a fact, pluralism is a choice and Canada lets diversity flourish. Okay, and this particular uh, painting beautifully tells that story of pluralism here in Toronto. Okay, next screen. Okay, okay. now initially I mentioned that I'll be showing you objects covering geographies all the way from Spain in the West, and we saw the astrolabe to China in the East, okay? So when you look at this beautiful porcelain dish, okay, it was made in Ming Dynasty, okay, in China in the 16th century. So this object was made in China specifically for export to Muslim countries, okay? okay? And if you look at this central medallion, Okay, in Arabic it reads Taharat, which means purity. And these inscriptions in Arabic, they read that blessed is the person who washes his hands from wrongdoing. Okay, so if you look at the depth of the dish and what the inscriptions say, okay, it was used uh, by a Muslim patron for ablution, which means washing hands before prayer in a personal home. And what we don't see uh, in this object, behind this object, if you were to see it from behind, again, there's a double circle in which in Chinese letters, and in some of my tours, I have people who can read Chinese. It says 16th century, uh, Emperor Zheng De Ming Dynasty. Okay? And at the back, we have an inscription which reads, ablution upon ablution is light upon light. So the Chinese maker, most likely he did not speak Arabic. He probably had some type of a phrase book from which he selected the right phrases to put on the front and the back of the dish. And what's most interesting is the phrases which he has selected when it says ablution upon ablution, that is the physical act of washing your hands before prayers. But the fact that he has put uh, the words light upon light, that talks about the nature of God as luminous light, okay? And that speaks to more the mystical dimension uh, of Islam, where people are said that you have to wash your heart or purify your heart and treat people in a, uh, with kindness and in a good manner so that your heart gets purified to experience the divine. So we have a wonderful example of a dish with those type of beautiful messaging 
incorporated in a dish which was made in China, but export to a Muslim country. Okay, so let's go to the last object. Okay, now this is interesting. Okay, if you look at the, it is a dish. Okay, sorry, it is a shell. Okay, which is incised with mother of pearl and is probably from Gujarat because Gujarat was known for craftsmanship in mother of pearl. If you look at it closely, there are eight concentric circles or rings. Okay, and within each ring are the verses of the Quran. Okay, now some Muslims believe that water which has come into contact with the Quran if you drink that water or if you pour that water over yourself, that water is both a form of blessing and for protection. And again, it depends on the personal belief of an individual Muslim. Okay? So we wonder, like, could this uh, shell with a concave shape have been made for that purpose? So the objects okay, tell us something about themselves but also in the minds of the visitors, they also leave questions. And that's exactly what we want when our people come uh, to visit the museum, that they should not only think of the object or when they look at the object, just to see what it is. I think they should also reflect on and think what it means. Uh, they should even wonder what this object or the artist is trying to tell us and even go deeper what does this object and the art make you feel inside? Okay. So this is what we try to achieve uh, within the tour roughly of one hour of our collection. And now I'll just try to summarize. Okay. Next slide. Okay. So if you are to ask in Prince Amin Aga Khan, who's the chairman of the board of trustees of the Aga Khan Museum, uh, he made a speech during the opening of the Aga Khan Museum and he said that if I was searching for one word to describe the museum, that word would be enlightenment. And you can think of enlightenment as an antidote to ignorance. So when, we st when I started my presentation, I gave you the reason why the museum was established. Okay, it was to replace fearful ignorance with empathetic knowledge. And in the end, I'm showing you that hopefully when visitors come through, or even today as a virtual visitors, I hope that you have been inspired by uh, what I've said in the last one hour, and you feel enlightened uh, about the arts of the Muslim world. Okay, okay. and the last slide. Okay, uh, just can you go back to the last slide? Yeah. Okay, so just to, to sum up what is the aspiration of our museum. Okay, and the Aga Khan, in, if you study his uh, speeches, okay, there was a scholar by the name of Samuel Huntingdon who, who talked about clash of civilization. And what the Aga Khan has been saying, okay, uh, in a world where many, some people speak of growing clash of civilization, he really hoped and believed that muse, the Aga Khan Museum will help to address what is not so much a clash of civilization as it is a clash of ignorance, okay? And that ignorance, uh, whether we like it or not, really it's, it's ignorance on both sides. Uh, even as Muslims, we are not quite knowledgeable about our own history. And, and we also, are not able, to, uh, even the West is ignorant about the Muslim history. Okay. So I would like to thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Bonji. Uh, we have a few questions uh, the audience asked during uh, your presentation. So yeah. I'm going to read those questions to you one by one. Yeah. Uh, so, let's so there is Ms. Zohra Mirani, and she yeah. is asking that, is there a virtual 360 access to the museum mentioned in the presentation? 
Oh, so you're talking about the action, uh, sorry, the access to the collection of the museum? Yes. Okay, so if you go to the Aga Khan Museum website, Aga Khan Museum, in one word, dot org, okay, what you'll find is the, every object which I have uh, described here, okay, has a description of the object on our website. And also our curators have created like three or four virtu virtual tours on different type of themes. So where you click on a tour and they will take you to three or four objects. And just like I was relating the story of the objects, okay, the curators relate the object. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Banji. We have yeah. next question from Noori Zehra Mehdi. Yeah. Um, she is asking that, is there an online platform to access the books on Islamic art and Ismaili literature? Uh, can you repeat the question? I didn't hear it. Is there an online platform to access the books on Islamic art and Ismaili literature? Okay, so when you talk about Ismaili literature, the best source for Ismaili literature is the Institute of Ismaili Studies. Okay. And they have a website. So if you Google Institute of Ismaili Studies, there you'll find uh, excellent literature on uh, Ismaili and Shia studies in particular, and also uh, Muslim civilizations in general. Uh, when you are looking for access, to uh, Islamic art and so on. One resource uh, could be that the Aga Khan University in London has Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilizations. And they offer excellent short courses and I've taken quite a few of them on Islamic art and history and also architecture. Uh, and sometimes these are just courses for uh, two sessions of three hours each or something like that. So these are two very good sources. And of course, if you go to the website of the Aga Khan Museum or the Royal Ontario Museum or the Metropolitan Museum or British Museum, all of them have collections of Islamic art and they have, they have both educational resources. Um, there's another question. Yeah. How could I learn more about pluralism? Oh, okay, interesting. Okay, so again, I will give you a resource. Okay. Uh, the Aga Khan in partnership with the Canadian government, I think in 2014, created Global Center for Pluralism. Okay, so there's a website called pluralism.ca, CA for Canada, pluralism.ca. You will find excellent resource material on pluralism. Thank you, Mr. Banji. And uh, the other, the excellent resource would be just Google uh, Aga Khan's speech on pluralism. And Aga Khan has made so many speeches on the subject of pluralism. So uh, these are two good resources for pluralism. Thank you, Mr. Banji. Yeah. Um, uh, Mohammed Charya Anis would like to thank you for the wonderful presentation. Thank and you. Yeah. He is stating that we need more step for interfaith and sex harmony yeah. by showing how we are all so connected as Muslims. Yeah. In fact, to me, this is a very uh, interesting observation because what we are hoping this museum to do is to bring people together. Okay. So, not only people of uh, Muslim communities to come together and understand our own history but also Muslims to come together with people of all the other communities and to the medium of art to have an exchange and dialogue. That's why I said in the beginning that the mission of the museum is to connect cultures through art. And in art, we are talking about beauty. And as human beings, all of us can look at a work of art and admire the beauty that, that is in art because art can has the ability, it transcends language, it transcends culture, and it has the power to bridge great divides. Uh, thank you, Mr. Banji. Yeah. Uh, we have Karim Ali Noor Husseini. Yeah. He is saying a uh, great presentation. Thank you um, for arranging such insightful sessions. So, yeah. 
No, again, uh, I would like to thank you uh, as a host for taking the initiative to arrange this. I would like to thank the participants. Uh, they've taken well, their valuable time and uh, they stayed an hour or hour 10 minutes with us. And thank you very much for this opportunity. And what I would like to do is in the event in future, if you're traveling to Toronto, okay, uh, what I've shown you does not do justice to the beauty of the art. It's really you have to see it to get the, but at least what I've tried to do is to give you an appreciation of what we have. Indeed. So Mr. Bhanji, in, the, in yeah. the end, what would you like to tell us as a feedback about this topic? Okay, so uh, what I've talked to you is about the art of the Islamic world. Okay, okay. Uh, if in future we can even explore the architecture Okay, of Islamic gardens, of Islamic buildings. Okay, so there's much more to learn about the art and the architecture and the culture of the Islamic world. Okay. We just have to immerse ourselves and take it slowly. So when I became a tour guide more than four years ago, I knew very little. I could hardly speak five, 10 minutes about this subject. And today, uh, I can get carried away and speak for a few, few hours. Okay? So it's all a question of interest and learning. And there's so much, uh, uh, there's so much in our own history that we owe it upon ourselves to educate ourselves. So I think that would be my parting message. It's a rich history and try to learn it. So true, so true. So yeah. thank you, Mr. Muhammad Panji, yeah. and thank you. thank you for giving us such valuable lessons. Yeah. And we hope uh, to have more interaction with you in yeah. the future. Yeah. And all of us here and the one who are going to listen to your recordings would like yeah. to thank you for your precious time. No, no. And I'm honored and I'm humbled by this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Muhammad Panji. Okay. Thank, thank you, everyone, you. for joining us. Bye. Uh, take care all of you. Thank you.